from the US. Um, he's a filmmaker from New York, uh, currently in Berlin because he's doing working on a project, um, well, on the founder of the PC maybe. Uh, but well, I guess we'll hear more about that from you, David. Herzlich uh, willkommen, welcome, Schmüde. Thank you. Part of my uh, Deutsch. Uh, I learn in Deutsch uh, jeden Tag, but it's not so good. So it's in English. I apologize uh, at the moment. Uh, I'm here today to talk about uh, harvesting human intelligence and what do I mean by that. Um, specifically, uh, it's important, I think, to talk about the limits of engineering and the power of ecosystems. And uh, I want to start off with a quote. Uh, this is a quote that was given by a U.S. senator once it was discovered there was uh, a mass uh, domestic surveillance network going on underneath our noses in the United States. This kind of unrestrained, illegal, secret intimidation and harassment of the essential ability of Americans to participate freely in American political life shall never happen again. Now that pledge sounds pretty... Uh, might resonate uh, pretty contemporarily, but it was actually given in 1975 uh, by Senator Walter Mondale. Um, some people that know a little bit about the history of surveillance might have heard of the Church Committee in the United States in 1975. Uh, this was a U.S. Senate investigation into uh, a mass domestic surveillance network that was unknown to the American people uh, before then. It kind of got uncovered in uh, 1973, uh, along with uh, Nixon's Watergate scandal, which some of you might have heard of, President Nixon. And of course, um, after that, Seymour Hersh uh, published a scathing uh, front page investigation on the New York, at the New York Times uh, about um, a CIA uh, basically dragnet on the American public. So it was headed by Frank, uh, by Frank Church here, as seen on the left. Um, and this whole thing kind of got out of control uh, pretty much because of the importance of signals intelligence in, war, uh, in uh, the Cold War. Uh, here, of course, is a familiar site to many Berliners, Teufelsberg, um, built in 19, uh, started in 1961. Uh, there was a base there, and by 1963, this was built by uh, my country's tax dollars uh, in Berlin. And, um, of course, there's a lot of money coming into the intelligence community at that time. And uh, a specific part, a specific uh, chunk of that money was going specifically to signals intelligence, the NSA. And uh, the NSA, of course, is responsible for making sure that our communications with our allies are encrypted and not legible or readable by other people. And conversely, um, they would like to crack into everybody else's communications. And this has been going on for a long time. This is an extremely computationally costly task. And this is where we get into the engineering. So the NSA um, has been at the forefront of supercomputing and uh, computers uh, since its inception. Um, many people don't understand how much money actually goes into the NSA. Well, in fact, Americans don't even understand how much money goes into the NSA to really uh, invest in forwarding computation technology. Um, the machine we're going to uh, focus on today uh, is the IBM Stretch, which was built in 1962. And this was a revolutionary piece of hardware, uh, a very large piece of hardware, uh, commissioned, co-commissioned by the uh, Atomic Energy uh, Committee and the NSA. And uh, the AEC wanted it for nuclear uh, testing and development. Uh, this is the computer that was used to develop the hydrogen bomb, for example. They needed a very fast machine. Um, this is also very important to the NSA because they needed a way to decrypt uh, foreign intelligence. So um, the features of the stretch include many features that we see in computers today. Uh, the interrupt system, uh, pipelining, look ahead. Some of the engineers in here probably know what these are. We'll talk a little bit about pipelining. I won't get too techy here, but pipelining is a very important concept that I just want to delve into uh, very quickly as we talk about signals intelligence. So part of stretch was harvest. And this is the layout of this giant machine. 
um, that was uh, built uh, in the east coast of uh, America. And uh, this is the central processing unit, which was stretched. It was, of course, gigantic. Um, here's the harvest attachment. And of course, harvest is, of course, relating to harvesting data. The NSA is interested in harvesting data. is their name for the machine. Um, the other side is the AEC floating point attachment that was for uh, very fast com computations of big numbers. Uh, there's a big bus here, system bus. This is RAM. There's giant cabinets of RAM. And then as we go uh, and look to the right, there's this thing called tractor. Okay. So tractor was used by Harvest to harvest uh, communications. Harvest specifically had a feature that was unique in the sense that it could take two input streams of data, of character data, and output one single stream. So you might have a, an encrypted, uh, encrypted stream coming in one side, and then a key or some semblance of a key coming in the other side, and out the back end comes, of course, the decrypted message. It was phenomenally fast, and it had access to a phenomenal amount of data. Obviously, there isn't a lot. Uh, there isn't many pictures of Harvest. Uh, this was top secret for quite a long time. Um, this is a picture of uh, Tractor. These are the tape decks. Okay. Um, every uh, tape deck uh, could automatically load uh, with software uh, uh, cartridges of these tapes. And in fact, on hand. Uh, the people that were running Harvest would have access to 44 billion characters of information. Um, that's talking about gigabytes of data in the 1960s, which is astonishing. Um, this, uh, these tapes could hold data, they could hold system utilities, it could hold software, and had a whopping transfer rate of one megabyte a second. So, of course, it had these great cryptographic uh, applications, but who can resist? using it for something else, right? Um, before Stretch even came to the market, they were already uh, using machines at the NSA to take tapes or take uh, telegrams to search and sniff through uh, domestic intelligence, or sorry, domestic communications, uh, mostly communications, uh, I should say, communications from Americans to Americans that might be overseas or to non-Americans that might be overseas. And they did it by uh, basically embedding themselves into Western Union, into AT&T, into RCA, into ITT. All these companies that are still situated on the lower tip of uh, Manhattan, where all the European cables came in. And they would take the tapes from these cables with a, an illegal mole, essentially, and bring them into a machine and scan them. Um, obviously, it's a lot more complicated and time-intensive than the way I describe it, but this operation was known as Operation Shamrock. This is the, uh, the declassified report describing Operation Shamrock, and it went on for 20 years. So, um, Operation Shamrock started in the 1940s and went on through the 1960s and uh, into the late 60s, and um, it was actually expanded in a sense with another operation called Operation Minaret. As the, uh, as the people in power in the executive branch, that's the presidential branch in America, as they became more and more paranoid, they began wanting more and more data. Sounds familiar? A lot of this should sound pretty familiar, actually. Uh, the NSA uh, placing moles into corporations in America and extracting data. Um, so, uh, the executive branch wanted more and more information of more and more Americans, and they eventually did something that was uh, definitely very illegal. Um, I'll read a quote from the Church Committee final report here. Ultimately, intelligence activity was directed against domestic groups advocating for change in America, particularly those who most vigorously opposed the Vietnam War or sought to prove, improve the conditions of racial minorities. And so, um, this Operation Minaret went on in, uh, until the early 70s, and it had a watch list specifically targeting specific Americans, tapping their communications without a warrant, violating the Constitution. Those Americans, we know some of their names, Martin Luther King, Jane Fonda, Muhammad Ali. It uh, goes on and on and on. And um, we get to a point when we look at all of this work that the church committee did in 1975 to wrangle in this intelligence community, which they successfully did to some degree, except for when we look at it from 2015, 
Everything looks disturbingly similar. There is one thing that is definitely different, though, than 1975, and it's the personal computer. And the personal computer uh, changes the game uh, of the black box these people in power can use, can leverage against their, uh, against their citizens. And uh, what we see here is the reaction to the personal computer very early on. Uh, 1977 was when the mass market personal computer uh, was introduced in America. 1982 was where, really when it hit its stride, um, started selling uh, millions of units. Uh, that was when the Commodore 64 uh, was introduced. And um, we see uh, very early on uh, reports about the horrors of hackers, okay? Information, in the, in, trespassing in the information age, pranks or sabotage. We have 2600 Magazine, which some of you are probably familiar with, the Hackers Quarterly, uh, that started in 1984. Uh, here's some software advertisements in the back of a magazine for some hacker tools, including a war games auto dialer, so you can keep trying every little phone number in the phone book until you find something you can hack into. This is a market in the 1980s, and it was a market um, that was extremely threatening. Um, computer legislation appeared almost immediately. Once there is a foothold of the PC into the world of Americans, uh, uh, of regular Americans, and once those regular Americans started tapping in to their government, tapping into corporations in ways that were not uh, were not authorized. Um, Legislation appeared almost immediately. Started in 1984, um, they eventually uh, passed the bill in 1986, and it was uh, really uh, a case of uh, trying to scare people in the US, US Senate because, uh, sorry, in US Congress because people really didn't understand computers. In fact, computer crimes go much further back than the personal computer. Uh, these are three computers involved in computer crimes. Uh, up here is the IBM Dehomag D11. Uh, that was used by the Third Reich in the uh, Holocaust. It was first of all used uh, for census taken, and then it was used to administer um, many of the uh, extermination by labor movements and some of the other um, sort of details within the Reich. Um, this was so popular, this machine, um, that it was actually installed at various camps uh, around the Reich, um, including Buchenwald. Um, they had huge Hollerith bunkers. Um, this one on the right here, that's IBM Stretch. Uh, that's the council for IBM Stretch. And of course, that was used, uh, as we've already talked about, um, to spy unconstitutionally on the American public, violating the foundation of uh, the Bill of Rights. Um, and then this one right here is the IBM 370. That was the computer of choice by the South African apartheid movement. And it was used to administer the heart of apartheid. Um, the problem seems to be, though, with these big computers and with the people that run the computers and the people that run the people that run the computers, they seem to be a little too big to jail. Here's James Clapper. Uh, he's, uh, he was the head of the NSA who stood in front of Congress in 2011 and said, Point blank, we do not collect metadata on American citizens. And of course, we know that is a lie. And I'll tell you, if I lied to Congress, I don't think they would just pat me on the back and let me go my way. Um, this is uh, James Angleton. He was in charge of the CIA Operation Chaos. That's also him in front of Congress testifying, telling non-truths. On the other side, we have whistleblowers. We have hackers, right? And these men and women um, are, of course, pursued to the fullest extent of the law quite often. And it seems a little unfair, and it also seems a little daunting that these people are seeming to take all the risks while the other people in power seem to be taking none, while the computers that were used to commit crimes, atrocities even, were never even considered to pass legislation against to try to regulate. But the personal computer, was so rebellious upon entering the marketplace that, okay, we've got to get this thing under control, right? But there's a pretty big misunderstanding, I personally believe, in what is actually happening with computers and where computers are going and where these big computers are going specifically. And I'm talking about this conception that the NSA 
is Skynet. The NSA is an organization that's going to know all and be all and be everywhere, and it's going to have an intelligent computer that can track every American citizen's every turn, right? This idea of an intelligent machine, the electronic brain, as it was called in the 1940s, goes all the way back to the beginnings. This is a picture of Thomas Watson uh, uh, Jr. on the cover of Time magazine with a very secretive robot saying, click, clack, think, as if a machine that old could even have any semblance of even passing the Turing test, any semblance of thought. See, there are limits to algorithmic thinkings. Now, I'm not saying that we won't surpass those limits. But what I am saying is that we have to be uh, pretty careful or pretty knowledgeable about, especially those of us who are trying to change, uh, move the needle in the digital society. We have to be very careful about how we consider computers and how they're how large computers do or do not empower individuals. This is uh, Alan Turing. He's the, him and, uh, him along with Alonzo Church were the founders essentially laying the foundations, I should say, of computer science. Uh, they laid the foundations. They proved it through, uh, that it was feasible to build a machine such as a computer uh, through uh, lambda calculus and ordinal logic. And through these proofs, Turing imagined a machine that is essentially the machine that we have today called the Turing machine. The Turing machine has a table of instructions, and it has data that comes through the stream. And depending on what data comes in the stream, might change what instruction is executed. What instruction is executed might change what data is on the stream. This is beautiful, it's elegant, and the, when he thought it up, it was literally groundbreaking. Right? But it's extremely limited, too because it doesn't take into account the things that we humans take just casually. Things like concurrency. Concurrency is something in computer science that makes people's heads blow up. There isn't like a great answer. If two, two computers try to manipulate the same piece of data, how do they negotiate that? Well, the answer is not clear. And there is, of course, there are many solutions for concurrency, right? But they aren't simple, they aren't trivial. Things that are trivial to us, like humor, they're not trivial to computers, of course. And so, the idea of electronic brains taking over the world, electronic brains that, of large computers being so powerful, so insurmountably uh, pervasive, might need to be rethought in my mind. Uh, we've been indoctrinated in this for years. 1952, this is a picture of UNIVAC uh, predicting um, the outcome of the Dwight Eisenhower election and actually out predicting the humans. Um, it was called, it was marketed as the electronic brain and uh, they actually thought the landslide prediction by UNIVAC was so uh, outrageous that they didn't announce it. Although the next day they had to come clean that UNIVAC actually predicted very accurately uh, the outcome of the election. Uh, of course, 2011, a lot of you probably remember when IBM's Watson won Jeopardy, um, kicked some human butt. Um, that event there uh, made it really seem like that, okay, the machine overlords are coming, right? They're in the shape of IBM Watson now. But really, even uh, Jeannie Rometty, the CEO of IBM, understands that Watson isn't about conquering humans. Watson is about augmenting human intelligence. IBM is marketing this machine not as something to replace a doctor, but to augment doctor's intelligence. That's exactly what it's being marketable, marketed as, and that's what it's being thought as, but when we see it in this publicity stunt here, it looks like it's out to replace us. And in fact, we have the advantage. We have the cards, because what we have is a large number of augmented brains. Corporations and governments have a small number of brains working with very large algorithms, right? And those algorithms aren't as smart as we think they are. On the other hand, we have, a, through the PC, um, a large number of brains, right? And we have a large number of possible algorithms. The problem with this is that there is no good engineering solution here. Unlike algorithms, algorithms have great engineering solutions. You want to solve concurrency, you solve it algorithmically. You want to solve concurrency in the real world, you talk to your friend and say, hey, uh, 
can I get the parking spot from this time to that time, and you get it from this time to that time? I mean, there's a negotiation. There's all sorts of, you read their body language. There's all sorts of messy human stuff that goes on. But the way that things end up working, actually working in our society, is through a healthy ecosystem. And a healthy ecosystem is defined by its diversity and its balance. And if this is something that we're interested in, building a great digital society, we have to think about our ecosystem before we think about engineering. This chart here is uh, pretty bad. Um, this is uh, the number of computer science graduates in the United States, I'm not sure how it is in Germany, divided by sexes. 18% uh, uh, a couple years ago, 18% of the people graduating with a computer science degree are women. And this is down from the 1980s when it was 37%, right? And what I'm specifically pointing at is a lack of balance and a lack of diversity in the ecosystem that we have built in technology. And it's not an engineering problem. It's a what? Yes, yes. Well, I mean, in, I think in Germany it definitely is, right? Um, I, in America, as far as a, a license problem, in terms of the degree uh, of computer science, it's also, in a liberal arts education, I think you want a very broad mix of thinkers to bring a very broad mix of ideas, right? So it's practical and it's also in theory. I think it, has two pro it shows two problems. And so what I'm talking about is yielding a harvest, right, with a healthy ecosystem, a healthy technology ecosystem. And when you have an ecosystem that is working, it is something that cannot be engineered. We have not figured out how to engineer an ecosystem that is diverse and balanced because it has so many externalities. In America, we love, for example, our genetically modified food, right? And um, every time we introduce a new crop with a new modified food, something comes in that we didn't expect and changes um, how we expected the crop to behave, right? So a huge number of externalities make it very difficult to engineer ecosystems. Also, concurrency and negotiation is the norm in every ecosystem. But in engineering, it's an exception. Right? It makes everything too messy almost. Right? So that's what we're looking for for uh, building a successful future, a successful future digital society. Now, there are many ways to solve this. Uh, we have engineers in here that are solving this. We have policymakers that are trying to solve this. Right? Um, thinking big picture, uh, one of the things that my team is working on, for example, is a film to solve this. We're working on an interactive project to try to broaden the uh, to broaden the conversation, right? Uh, as I was introduced, uh, the film that we're working on, the interactive project, to be more uh, precise, is discussing the history of the personal computer uh, as it relates to the life and times of Jack Trammell, the founder of Commodore, who was, of course, an Auschwitz survivor. Um, so if you're interested in the things that were discussed in this talk, I just ask you to please uh, go to uh, www.jackinthemachine.com. Check out the trailer. See if it's something that you're interested in. If you are, sign up for the mailing list. What we're doing right now is we're just generating interest. We're showing people that this is out there, we're telling, that we're telling the story, and we're bringing it to uh, financiers, to advertisers, to people that can make this project bigger. Um, also, one other plug. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, I'm also speaking a different talk at Picha Kucha. Um, at Vatos Tacos, so I thought I'd get that in there too. Okay, thanks. Well, thank you, Schmutter. Any questions, comments? Yes, over here. I deliberately talked about the license and I think the ecosystem and the engineering system are bridged by the license. And I think there is a misunderstanding, deep misunderstanding, in the understanding of what open source is and do, for example, for the purpose of the NSA to harm the society. I, 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 
I, and I want to put the following. How, ab um, okay, this was too fast. Uh, there is a concept that say, we should just allow ourselves to know and to hack everything without any evaluation of the doing that we do and the distract that is resulted from what we do. And there is a concept uh, relating knife that can be good, use good or bad, but not tank. So now I'm very short. What is your opinion on HGPL license, which is humanitarian HGPL, that would not allow use of that code for killing people, uh, harming people, the whatever, with some human values over it? Thank you. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, so uh, what we're talking about, I think, is we're talking about licensing. Uh, I thought you were talking originally about licensing uh, programmers, but we're actually talking about licensing the license of software, right? And what software um, can be used for. Uh, so my background is in film and in artificial intelligence, and of course in AI. Uh, the the question always is: uh, uh, if a computer kills someone that you programmed, right? I mean, are you to to blame, right? And so these sorts of ethical questions. Um, are pretty unclear right now. The one that you're talking about, I think, is a little bit more clear. Um, I think, uh, I don't want to speak for the open source community because I'm not, uh, I'm sure there are many people that could speak more articulately here than I can. Um, but I feel like the licensing system in open source is working. I feel like that um, the way, uh, the rights of use are, are a model for, uh, and I just have to go back to Richard Stallman, a model for allowing the software to be free, right? Uh, but with some author's intent and restrictions. I think that's a fair compromise to make, but maybe I'm not, um, maybe I'm not. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Question or comment? All right then. Uh, thank you, Schmuder. I guess uh, you'll be around for beer, maybe, or 